Thanks. I'd like to welcome you to today's NASAMS webinar, Discover New York University, What Are Institutions Doing to Comply with State Authorization Requirements? Thank you so much for joining us today, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Brianna Bates serves as the Assistant Director of Academic Program Review at New York University. Her unit within the office is responsible for spearheading any necessary non-New York state approvals and for supporting new program registration and monitoring program changes with the New York State Department of Education, serving as a liaison to the Middle States Commission on Higher Education, administering the university's compliance with FERPA, or FERPA um, and overseeing the Academic Affairs and Compliance Office serving the Intercollegiate Athletics Program. In addition, the office oversees the creation and implementation of several organizational systems that serve to both efficiently and effectively manage the institution's vast activity levels in relation to compliance standards. Bates is a graduate of the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia, and has previously served as Accreditation Information and Accounts Specialist with the Distance Education and Training Council in Washington, D.C., and as Accreditation Coordinator in the Office of the Assistant Provost at New York University. Bates is attending NYU's Robert F. Wagner Graduate School of Public Service, where she is pursuing an MPA in Public and Nonprofit Management and Policy, with a specialization in International Policy, and is preparing to apply to a JD program in the fall of 2016. So with that, I'm pleased to turn the presentation over. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I really appreciate it. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, as Stephanie shared, I used to work for the DETC, now DEAC, when Mike Lambert was the executive director there. So that was when I was first introduced to the NASAP community. Um, and it's always just been a wealth of knowledge and really wonderful and helpful members and people. So it's an honor to be able to sit on the institution side of the house and just kind of share with you guys today a little bit about um, what NYU is is doing to comply with state authorization requirements and kind of coming from the angle of uh, the, knowing that all kinds of institutions call you guys every day and um, it might just be helpful for you to give them suggestions or feedback on what other institutions are doing that might help them um, kind of more efficiently get into compliance with your regulations. Um, so I'm going to just start with a short video about New York University to kind of put in context our size and our offerings and then I'll go right into what we do for compliance. Hi, Russ. How are you? Hi, Brianna. I'm well. Just headed to grab some lunch. Oh. Oh, Russ? These are my friends. Friends? This is Russ Hamburger, NYU's Associate Provost. Russ, you have perfect timing. It would be an honor if you'd help me teach my friends about NYU. Well, okay. Great. All right, everyone. Let's hop on board this flight to New York University. You are all our VIP guests today, so no tickets are necessary. I hope that everyone has their seatbelts on because we are ready for takeoff. Oh, look, we're flying over Washington, D.C. now. NYU's first stateside study away site, which opened in 2012. Next stop, New York City. Welcome to New York City. Russ, can we buy hot dogs from a streetcar? Maybe later, Brianna. Let's welcome our friends first. Welcome to New York University, located in Greenwich Village, what some may call the heart of New York City. NYU enrolls 50,000 students, offers more than 800 programs, not including dual degree programs, and has 23 online program offerings. We also have 15 different degree granting schools, two other degree granting units, 11 study away sites, and two international degree granting campuses. Wow, Russ, that's amazing. Where are the study away sites and in international campuses? The study away sites are in Accra, Berlin, 
Buenos Aires, Florence, London, Madrid, Paris, Prague, Sydney, Tel Aviv, and the one we flew over just a moment ago, Washington, D.C. NYU has two portal campuses through which students can enter NYU. NYU's first international campus is located in Abu Dhabi in the United Emirates, where the student body is currently 725 strong, studying in 22 different program offerings with a four to one student to faculty ratio. And there are over 98 different languages spoken. NYU's second international campus location is in Shanghai, China, where NYU is the first U.S. university to grant degrees in China, has an eight-to-one student-faculty ratio, and a student body that represents 50 different countries. Wow, Russ, that's a lot of activity and data to keep track of. What about activity in the United States related to state authorization compliance? Well, Brianna, when we consider proctoring, marketing, and advertising, recruiting, online education, faculty state of residence, and online CEUs, it's safe to say that NYU has some type of activity in every state. Due to the complicated nature of our activity, it would be helpful for you to share with our friends how we manage this. Well, Russ, I'm just the animated version of Brianna. What we need is the real me. Hold on, folks. I'm going live. So that's just a little bit about um, NYU's reach kind of globally and stateside um, and some of the programs and scope of what we offer. And kind of looking back to 2009 to 2015 and thinking about this landscape of state authorization and how it's just expanded um, kind of back in 2009 when the Harkin hearings began, uh, I guess as an institution or just industry person, the perception was that um, the state regulators were kind of in their state working with schools in their states and some of the for-profits uh, were complying and kind of taking action to come into compliance, but that's kind of when it all started. And then in 2012, you saw a lot more of the for-profits, some of the non-profits kind of beginning to come into the state authorization world and having that realization that there were regulations that mattered outside of their home state. And present day 2015, we just have a whole bunch of fish in the sea. We're all kind of in the same bucket of asking questions, getting answers, filling out paperwork, sending them to you, trying to figure out how much it costs. Um, and kind of simultaneously, I think, especially NASAPs and probably SHEO used to be spaces where you guys as regulators used to kind of come together and network and share information. And you've probably noticed a steady increase in the amount of institutions that are flocking to those conferences um, to try to learn more about this and try to learn more about you and your offices um, and just even um, networks popping up that those institutions are joining, like the WCET SAN network, that institution are joining to try and just share information and um, literally just kind of picking up the phone and calling each other. And I have a lot of schools that call me and say, hey, Brianna, have you complied in North Carolina yet? Or do you have a copy of the regulations for Puerto Rico? Or uh, what did you do about the data report in Maryland? So we've definitely just noticed this um, this growth pattern and this steady increase in kind of your world and us kind of flooding it and trying to figure it out. <laughs> so within that landscape, um, the survey that NASAPs did in 2015 kind of pulled out these um, four main points uh, of things that really institutions could do a lot better at. And I think that this was really helpful, um, especially for institutions to see that already had people working on state authorization and also for the a, a resource as a tool for institutions that weren't working on state authorization to help them realize that they needed to. Um, so for, for this purpose, we kind of um, see excessive inquiries. Institutions are just picking up the phone and kind of just calling the regulators and saying, what do I need to do? Hi, my name is Brianna from NYU. Can you help me? Um, and just failure to research the regulations and disclose their activity. So kind of aside from the smaller group of institutions that are opening and operating without approval or closing without prior notice or teach out plans, um, this is kind of the realm that the rest of us as institutions are operating in of just confusion. Where do I start? Where do I get the information? How do I figure out what office I need to call? And then let me dial the number. Um, and really kind of the realization that 
institutions need to read the regulations and view your website and really understand what's going on before they pick up the phone is a, is a pretty new concept to some institutions. And um, a lot of the institutions are feeling like, am I going to get in trouble if I call? I'm, I've even recently had some institutions call me at NYU and say, what do you tell the regulators when you call? Do you give them a hypothetical situation? Like, if I had a student in Tennessee and, does, you know, yeah, kind of that whole bubble of what if. And um, I always just say to them, you know, the regulators are really nice and they're going to work with you and you're working to comply. And as long as you're being honest and disclosing what you have, you can work together to get your application in and do what you need. So my approach here at NYU is always what, you know, kind of reading the website and regulations first thoroughly, outlining it in relation to my institutional activity. And then if I have questions, I just pick up the phone and call your office and say, you know, I read this, I don't understand it, or I'll shoot you an email. And um, a lot of people, I think, are just kind of unnecessarily scared of sharing information or communicating on the institution side because they don't know what's going to happen. And my advice is always the worst thing that could happen is that you're aware of activity that you're not supposed to be doing and all of a sudden something goes wrong with a student complaint or a state becomes aware of it and then you're kind of in the hot seat and that's not a place you want to be. So it's better to just kind of get the budget, get the staff, and go ahead and work through um, work through whatever you need to do to comply. Uh, so then from there, kind of there's this disconnect with the licensure boards, which I'm sure you guys have heard so much about, uh, kind of starting in the world of nursing and higher ed and trickling down from there. Um, and one thing that uh, we've realized here at NYU as we, as we started to navigate this terrain is that there's a little bit of inconsistency in some of the states, um, but for the most part, the state regulator office um, is a little progressed uh, compared to the state licensure boards, and they're really willing to be flexible when it's not clear which one you need approval from first. So a lot of the institutions are trying to get summary information and say, where do I go? What do I do? What needs approval? What doesn't? It's not clear. Um, there's not a great summary that exists. There's currently not a CHEO survey of licensure boards for nursing or for teacher education, and uh, should we as institutions be creating that? Um, and it's and it is really helpful um, during the process. I've spoken to a lot of regulators here in NYU's process that will very early on in the process say to me, if you have nursing, don't forget, you know, you have to do this or call Barbara in this office. Um, so that's always really helpful and nice. Um, I think that the licensure side of this from the institutional standpoint is something that's kind of new, newer to us, like state authorization was maybe five years ago. We're just becoming aware of it and starting to staff on and do what we need to do to comply. Um, so I think a lot of the questions there, it is helpful if you can share anything about your licensure boards with the institutional folks when they're going through accreditation or when they're going through the process for approval with your office. Uh, that would be worth its weight in gold. <laughs> um, and then the fourth item was just too many cooks in the kitchen, um, just too many people from the institutions. Sally calls you one day, Brianna calls you the next, they have the same question, and you guys are probably thinking, what is going on at that institution? And um, basically, I think that 90% uh, of the time, it's probably not with malicious intent of trying to get, um, you know, Betty to give you a different answer so that you can put the paper in the folder and move on and not pay, it's probably one of two things on the institution side. One is just confusion and lack of FTE allocation for one person to do this. So people just don't understand it. It keeps getting passed around. They haven't hired one person to centralize and oversee it. So it's kind of bouncing around from office to office, and everyone's trying to kind of grapple with it and understand it and navigate it, um, or at least begin to try to come up with a plan to navigate compliance in this area. Um, and kind of number two uh, is that a lot of times the programs that these institutions are becoming aware of state authorization requirements before the central offices, and especially the programs that lead to licensure, like social work and nursing and teacher education. Um, and they, uh, you know, they might kind of probe with the central office, I've heard of this happening, and say, hey, what about the state authorization thing? We need your help to do something so our students can go do their clinicals in other states. We're sending them, and right now that's not okay from what we're reading or from the information we're getting from our specialized accreditor. And um, I think a lot of times, unfortunately, they're not getting the support that they need from the central office, so they take it on themselves and say, hey, the School of Social Work is going to call Virginia and figure out what we need to do there with our distance ed students or something like that. Um, so 
you know, social work might call today, but then nursing might call tomorrow. So I think that's kind of where uh, too many cooks are being seen. And um, NYU's strategy from the beginning has always been one person, one contact, strategize, read and learn the regulations, and then call and ask. But that's really not the systematic approach that most institutions are able to take, whether it's because of budget restrictions or just lack of awareness and understanding. Um, so I, I think in that case, Tell them what you want to say, you know, who is your contact at NYU or at, you know, Bob's University um, for this for this issue? I'll, I'll write them down in my database and I'll expect to hear from that person because um, that's one way it can probably make your lives a lot easier and calmer and also just giving the institutions a little direction um, and and just advice of, you know, it'll be easier for me, it'll be easier for you, let's, let's have kind of a plan and attack this together. Um, so kind of internally at NYU, what's happening is um, we've developed a pretty robust way to manage state authorization compliance with all of the campuses and schools and programs that we offer. Um, we've built internal and external relationships. Um, that was kind of our first approach of first connecting with the individual schools. We have 17 schools, 17 deans, and kind of getting them on board and just saying, this is what state authorization is. I'm just warning you, we're going to have restrictions until we get into 100% compliance, and there will be things that you can and can't do, and it, there will be a change, and, um, and we'll work with you, and we'll prioritize according to what your priorities are in your respective units, but, but some activity will be on hold, whether it be marketing and advertising or sending your students to do internships um, or hiring faculty faculty who live in another state, you know, just making them aware that something is coming and explaining to them um, legally where the issue comes from and that it's not Brianna being the bad guy in the provost office saying, no, you can't do something you've been doing for the past 20 years, but that, you know, there was a regulation change. Some institutions were a little behind on it. We're not going to be behind on it anymore, and it's really important for our students that we do this. Um, and then from there, kind of externally trying to reach out and to all of the offices that do have um, jurisdiction over oversight of your type of school or your type of offerings and just trying to connect with all of you and say, you know, we, we get it, we're going to comply, we're, you know, we plan to do Alabama next year, but until then we're restricting activity. So, you know, you've heard from NYU and we've connected and we have a plan. Um, so that's kind of been the biggest thing. Uh, for us and kind of keeping that central and every year bringing all of those people at the institution together and communicating. And even beyond the dean's office, um, we have liaisons for state authorization in our undergraduate admissions office, in our career center, in our office of um, marketing and advertising, I mean, any office or unit, even within athletics um, and some of the athletic recruiting people, you know, in some states like Florida, we register all of our recruiting agents as individuals so that they can go down there and attend college fairs and recruit, but be in compliance and adhere to Florida standards when they do that. Um, so that's kind of central to us, and I think that's one piece that a lot of the institutions miss, and that's kind of when you're getting all those calls from multiple people at, at one institution, that's probably the missing piece is that they haven't realized yet that it's not only about relationships with an individual regulator at an office, but really about what relationships you have on your own campus and that you've communicated with everybody that has anything to do with the regulations that you have for your office. Um, and then simultaneously, we've been able to um, create a lot of internal resources to support our schools. So. I'm only one person, and I do have a small staff here, but um, there's only so much that individual people can do to disseminate this much information about compliance to the units. Um, so we've developed uh, an in-house website where we break up by trigger um, so they can see, you know, for non-classroom experiences, this is how we define it, and this is a chart of where you can and can't go based on what, where our approvals are and what the states need from us for approval. Um, and, you know, kind of this is our distance education link, um, and this is our page on that, and this is, these are all the states that you can't currently enroll students in for distance education programs. Um, so we've been able to develop that, and I think that that's been a really good resource so that our 
field placement coordinators or our kind of course development people and program development people um, aren't lost and confused. They know exactly where to go to get the information on what is and isn't okay. Um, and then with that, with our annual meeting every year, we update everyone on where we are in compliance. So we're at 74% compliance across the board in terms of gaining approval and exemptions, but we operate daily at 100% compliance because we reviewed all states' regulations and we've, no we've noted where we need to restrict where we haven't been able to get approvals or exemptions yet. Um, and that's kind of what we had to do with the staff that we had because the manpower that it takes to do the applications, you just, we couldn't knock them all out in one year. So we looked at where most of our activity was in relation to um, where we needed to do something and came up with a strategic plan to kind of knock off the busier states um, first and then some of the uh, less busy states for NYU to offer education in after that. Um, we also provide a regular newsletter to uh, all of the stakeholders of the university that have any activity related to this. So we have over 500 people on our listserv, and they get updates on any kind of policy changes, any kind of things they should be aware of um, on our website that's been updated, uh, anything that's happening at Capitol Hill with reauthorization of the Higher Education Act, anything that's happening with the SARA Reciprocity Agreement. Um, New York just joined that uh, last week, so Governor Cuomo signed it, and that'll probably be in our next newsletter, but that doesn't mean anything right now until we have a portal agency to join through. So we'll update our schools on all of that so that they know what's coming and how it will impact them. Um, and then one thing that we've spent a lot of time and resources on internally, and I think that this is really important for some of the states and probably doesn't matter for others, is coming up with a system to track where our students actually are. Um, and specifically for NYU, the burden is where are they going to do these non-classroom experiences, which we consider to be internships, externships, clinicals, practicums, clerkships, anything where they're physically going to another state for a learning experience. Um, and I think some of the other more distance education heavy schools um, just a portal, uh, what is your residential address? And we have 25 distance education programs here at NYU, so we have both that we need to track. Um, so it was I think this is probably the area that institutions get tripped up on the most, and they probably call you and say, well, how am I supposed to do that, Sally? You know, I don't have a system for that. How do you recommend I tell you where all my students are? Um, and for this, it was um, a big endeavor, but it was a big relationship between our Office of Institutional Research, who was able to go into the um, student information system and figure out the academic plan codes for every option of distance education enrollment um, and pull that report to give us one report of where everybody is and every semester they have to update their address so if their residence changes and they move we know where they've gone to and we can kind of strategize accordingly and reach out if we need to to regulators to get um, any kind of new action or activity or application in that we need to and then um, we couldn't use the information system to track our students um, who were doing non-classroom experiences because there was no unique identifier for those courses um, and we needed a lot more information of what we learned from the regulators we didn't just need to know where Bob is going for his internship this summer and in terms of what state sometimes we needed to know what he was doing was it a, a business internship? What are the dates of the internship? Is he paid or unpaid? Um, is it for credit or not credit? Not for credit? Is it required for his program or is it optional? Those are all things that could change what we need to do in an individual state or what we need to share with an individual state. So we were able to identify our career center as a as a portal for that um, because all students have access to it. So they get the link three times a semester. Students report on the information and. And we're able to run a comprehensive report and really see where our students um, are going. And I, I did a presentation to institutions earlier this week on this, and there were almost 200 people logged into the presentation. They had great questions about how did you build this? How can we build it? How did you get started? And the one thing that I made sure to say was um, NYU didn't always have a system, <laughs> just as a lot of those schools on the call don't have systems. And our first round of compliance uh, was literally, I, I said to the school, tell me where your students are. And they said, well, we don't keep records of that. Or, oh, I'll send someone over with the information. And they dropped off a folder to me that literally looked like the dog ate my homework. <laughs> it was just, you know, crumpled papers and handwriting. And we had a student worker come in and enter all of those in a database and kind of said, okay, we know this isn't 100%, but we have to start somewhere. So let's, this is our first round of an attempt at compliance, and we're just going to be honest with the regulators. Right now, this is the information we have, and we're developing a system to get better information.
information. Um, so kind of just the fear of institutions of being overwhelmed. They feel like everything has to be 100% on the first round, and what can they do in the meantime? And um, what we found is that a lot of times, um, you know, you just have to try. You have to start somewhere. Um, and that's where we were able to start and from there grow into this more robust system where we work with institutional research as well as the Career Center to really have a comprehensive view of not only where all of our students are going, but being able to drill down within program and specialization and within what's for credit, what's not for credit, what's required, what's optional. Um, now we have all of that data and we can really click a couple buttons and spit out a report and send it in either annually or each semester to whatever states require us to report that information. Um, so that's kind of been a, a really big thing here. It was just um, piloting systems like that, implementing them university-wide, and remembering that they can always be improved and we can just keep making them um, even better. And kind of um, within that world, uh, within our licensure programs, um, working with them to have workshops on how do you, um, everything from the basics of how do you correspond with a regulator? How do I feel, how do I figure out who my regulator is? How do I fill out this application? So we have many workshops that we do for our programs that lead to licensure because we can't actually do those applications for them because in most cases they're so specific to the subject matter. And I just have to say, look, I'm not a nurse. I can't fill this out. I have no idea what these acronyms mean, but somebody from the nursing school absolutely can and needs to. Um, so we kind of um, serve as a consulting hub to just advise them on, you know, this looks good, or, you know, you could do more here, you could speak to the standard here, this is what they're looking for there. Um, so we do many workshops to empower our schools that lead to licensure to be able to work with us. Um, and that's especially the case in states where we need to give them a copy of the approval from the licensure board, because when they're done with that process, I need a piece of paper from them that I can give to you. <laughs> um, so that's kind of been something that's evolved here, too, and I think a lot of the schools and other institutions um, that are our peers are calling here all the time asking these questions or kind of silent on the other end of the phone with you saying, I just don't know how to do this. I just can't wrap my head around this. Um, so with the progress that we've been able to make here at NYU, we've also realized that um, there was a great opportunity for us to be able to kind of get a little innovative in this space and see how we can improve our systems um, to get a little better because we still had our days where people would call and say, I launched X, Y, and Z program and somebody last week told me that I should call you. Um, so. We were able to create a form that is part of our academic approval process, so anytime there's a new program or program change, um, we catch it right there. There is no more launching of programs without our office knowing about it. It's a state authorization activity form, and it has information about all the potential activities um, in a kind of broad form. You know, do you have an internship or not? Yes. And if they say yes, it drills down into the things that matter. And from there, um, we get alerted when the report is filled out and have a meeting with them before they ever launch the program or even get approval in New York State um, to say, it's great that you're doing this program, we're really excited about it, this is state authorization and these are the restrictions at NYU right now. And if we will be 100% compliant and you won't have these restrictions over the next two years, but right now this is, this is where we are with this project. Um, so that's helped a lot as well. And from there, we kind of took it a step further most recently and we've been building a state authorization advisor so this has uh, been a really large and complex project, and I think a little bigger than any of us really bargained for in the beginning, but also much more exciting and rewarding as we progress every day on it. And I think at the core, it's really a massive research project. <laughs> um, so really just kind of reading regulations, extracting information about what matters, and kind of uh, in a way that the SHEO survey does it, but a step beyond, because um, we take the fact that does the state or state agency care or not care about internships, yes or no, and then most of the time there's some uh, kind of nuance and something very unique and special to a state agency. Uh, if it's more than three days, they'll, they want to regulate it, or if it's more than three days and costs more than $500, or if it's required for program completion. Um, so a lot of times there's um, things around that that we've tried to capture within our robust database of just really understanding um, all of the nuances so that we don't miss any 
anything here, and we don't end up in danger of noncompliance. So we've gotten to a place where we're strong enough with our basic compliance that we're ready to kind of dig a level deeper and really understand the nuances of the compliance and see if we're missing anything and um, just kind of how we can get better at that and have a space where we're not missing anything even at our institution. So this tool allows us to crowdsource information. Um, multiple people from our institution can reply to the questions depending on a specific state. And, um, you know, we can kind of see maybe I thought I had no internships happening in, in New Mexico before, but uh, somebody from the journalism school replied and indicated that they did, and I didn't know about that before. So this is kind of a validity check internally as well for us. So um, it's in the beta phase. It's not fully functioning yet. We're testing it out um, with our people and kind of seeing how it's going. But when they log in, they can see uh, a map and select the state that they're interested in learning more about and then kind of drill down um, to be able to see in detail individual reports that have already been filled out. If they've been verified by somebody else at the institution, it'll tell you. And then if we have a regulation change and we need to do an update to the information we have about a state, we have the ability to send out an email to all of the users that have responded on behalf of that state so we can alert people that something has changed. So this is kind of going a step beyond the basic newsletter that we have here at NYU and creating really a live, real-time space to correspond and house data um, and kind of even to see how Sarah impacts it. So we've been able to build in this little pink box here that, um, you know, are we a member of Sarah and what does that mean? Because Sarah is coming soon for, for New York State, which is really exciting. Um, so when they get into the advisor, it, it just looks like a basic question and answer tool. And this is a sample that I just did a screenshot um, from to determine uh, with New Mexico. So, you know, kind of denoting um, what kind of status you have and then kind of moving through for things that they care about, like how many agents you have that do recruitment. And then um, this is a tool to help us budget as well. Um, if we have two agents and if they charge $200 per agent, we're going to pay $400. And, and that's a basic formula, but as you guys know, some of the um, fee calculations can be pretty complex in an area where you guys probably get a lot of questions of just, I don't understand the finances of this. How do I figure out what it's going to cost me um, to comply? And um, just kind of seeing if um, if any of the triggers are, are happening and then kind of advisement of, okay, we have two recruiters, this is what it'll cost, we have this many programs, and kind of building in on the back end a way to calculate that so that it's more user-friendly to our, our school people and to users um, to be able to kind of get an estimate so we know where we're going. We know if it's going to be $500 or $5,000 because uh, sometimes budgets can, can easily absorb 500, but 5,000 um, could potentially be a little bit of a stretch in some cases. So that's kind of uh, something that we're working on that's really exciting and innovative here at NYU um, and, and just kind of how we're managing it and some tidbits about some of the questions that the peer institutions um, have been able to share with us and some of the things that we think are pretty cool. <laughs> um, so I'm very curious to know uh, any feedback from you guys uh, on what you think of the system, uh, things that you see that are gaps in the system, ways we could improve the system, um, anything, any reactions that you have to share about um, how we're navigating the space would be really great, or any questions about it as well. Okay, well, great. Thank you very much. And for the attendees, you can send in any comments or questions through that. It looks like we have a question that has popped up um, saying, the system looks great, but how, we're, how will SARA membership affect the authorization advisor process? That's a great question. Um, I th SARA is something that we started building into this um, probably about a month ago. Um, so it's in an earlier beta phase than the rest of the tool. But um, what we were able to figure out was if the state is a member of SARA, then essentially our understanding is that um, they've agreed to SARA's definition of physical presence as opposed to their agency's definition of physical presence. Um, so some of the questions that would normally be a trigger and a need for approval in a SARA state are now irrelevant because um, they've agreed to the SARA definition of physical presence. So we're able to replace um, the question and decision tree for individual states with the SARA decision tree that we've created and um, 
answer the, the questions relevant to Sarah, and then if they have activity outside of the scope of Sarah, um, you were able to kind of pick that up from the question answers that they go through and know that, hey, there's a situation here where there's some activity that's not covered by Sarah, um, and you know, we need to do something with this state in addition to being a Sarah member. Because um, I think that Sarah is a really great thing, but I think a lot of the um, institutions are a little confused if they don't read it in detail. They think that it um, is kind of this uh, holy grail that covers everything, and they join Sarah, and they don't ever have to worry about states that are members of Sarah. And um, what we've realized from kind of a more detailed and in-depth reading of Sarah's regulations is that Sarah is great, and it covers a lot, but it doesn't cover everything. So, for example, uh, nursing schools uh, have a licensure issue, and Sarah does not cover placements for programs that lead to licensure. So there still is probably going to be some kind of approval process there. If not with the Sarah State, then definitely with the Board of Licensure for Nursing in that Sarah State um, so that you can get the appropriate approvals to have that clinical experience happen in another state. Um, so things like that, I think right now that schools aren't aware of, or they just think, oh, Sarah is an option for us. We're all set. We don't need to worry anymore. Um, that realization that that's not actually the case always, depending on the type of activity, um, is something that we wanted to try to um, help navigate within the tool and just kind of the realization of that and building it in um, alongside the things that matter in the individual state. So in some cases, you know, they might not have such activity, but in other cases, if they do, we want to know because that means our membership in SARA um, isn't covering everything and we need to, to contact the state in addition to that. And that's not a huge thing for us today in New York because I don't have a Sarah portal agency yet. And New York just joined uh, or passed the bill to join Sarah, but um, I think it, it will be. So we're kind of trying to, to plan for that. All right. Well, thank you. Um, we'll hold just a moment, see if any other questions come in through that chat. I think another thing uh, to, to talk more about Sarah, um, I think 99.9% .9 of the time, Sarah is going to be a good choice for almost all institutions that's going to save you money. Um, and, and for NYU, we were really eager to join Sarah after Minnesota joined Sarah because that was going to be a really expensive state for us to seek approval in. Um, and once they became a member of Sarah, it's likely that the price to join Sarah will be a lot less than even just our fee in Minnesota to get approval of all of our programs. Um, so there's a cost-benefit analysis, too, um, that, that we're able to look at. And I think when Sarah was smaller and there was only five or six states, uh, maybe the cost in some states to join didn't outweigh the cost to just comply with individual states. Um, so now it's bigger and it's at a point where it's worth it. But what's interesting for our senior leadership is to see what we saved. So if I submit a bill for uh, $8,000 to join Sarah, what would the bill have been without Sarah? How can I justify spending that $8,000 to Sarah? So with this analysis, um, I can, within you know a couple number of clicks, um, print something out for my senior leadership and say, you know, that $8,000 that I used of, of my budget to join Sarah, look at what it could have been without Sarah. This is the benefit of every dollar that we've spent there. So um, it's just nice to be able to, to kind of account for where your budget's going and, and how it's being used as well. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any further questions in the chat at this time. Of course, um, we will have um, a feedback mechanism at the end of the webinar, um, and you'll be able to have email information and contact information for um, for NASAPS to, um, you know, if you think of any further questions after you've thought about this a bit, we, you can certainly send those in through email. Um, I guess we will go ahead and get ready to close out then. NASAPS would like to thank the presenter today and thank all of you for participating in this NASAPS webinar. We hope that you enjoyed the presentation and we invite you to check the NASAPS website for new programs and resources. We do have some additional webinars going to be coming up. Um, we have something um, we're trying to get confirmed for September. We have an offering in November, so we'll be adding information to the NASAPS website um, with all of that information. 
And also an invitation out to the attendees today, if you have a topic or speaker recommendation or if there's something that's interesting and innovative happening within your organization that you would like to share as a webinar presentation, we'd love to hear from you in that capacity as well. So we'd appreciate to hear your feedback um, about other topic suggestions.